Colonizing the solar system has been a science fiction dream and an open question we've asked ourselves for decades after the Cold War space race showed it really was a possibility. It's hard, a distant one, but it is possible. That actually was a concept far older. Ideas of colonizing the moon go back to the 17th century, but no one really knew how to do it in the distant past. Not enough information was available. And as late as the early 20th century in the films of Georges Méliès, we see the concept, originating with Jules Verne, of using a giant cannon to shoot a spaceship to the moon like a giant artillery shell. We ended up doing that in a little bit different of a way due to the tricky nature of firing humans into space on artillery shells. But we now know that we can do it with rockets, which isn't that different from artillery, but it's hard. Yet we can now do it. But the real question is, what is the return? I mean, if you throw tons of taxpayer or private investor money into it, what are you going to get back? The realities that come down to strategic or economic advantage and strategic concerns specifically is an open question. That's a question of geopolitics and doesn't need to make money. But the economic interest is unclear but actually getting better, at least overall. I do not think that I would want to relocate to Mars and live in a dome selling pizzas or even making YouTube videos. Too much trouble. There are those, however, that would jump at the chance. So what is there on those bodies to mine that would make it worth it to return to Earth? Not a lot, at least right now. But that question is conditional and subject to change. But there are people that would colonize other worlds for personal reasons. In other words, just to do it. Make no mistake, there are some people that would go to Mars to prove that they can do it. It's the idea of I climb it because it is there, right? Climb Mount Everest and summit it well, how about climbing the highest known mountain in the solar system in a spacesuit and be the first to do it, Olympus Mons on Mars? It is unclimbed, and it falls into the same idea. And if you have the funds to spend, people will do it. So there is tourism. And there are also those that are simply just done with Earth and looking for something else. You only live once. And if you're not happy here, go somewhere else, even if it kills you or spend the rest of your existence in an artificial and very dangerous environment. Do it because it is there, is what that boils down to. But that's ultimately a vacation, and a pastime, or a personal goal. You could make money eventually, as a hotel chain, with a space station in low Earth orbit from those looking for the ultimate vacation. You can already pay someone to jump out of a plane if you want to, but other than that, Fully colonizing other worlds has few ways to make a ton of money otherwise. Few, but they are there. Asteroid mining maybe, but gravity wells are more limited. Yet yeah, once a colony gets its own internal economy going, that's one thing. But you have to get it started first. Taking the economic question into account, however, are there areas of the solar system that one can make a living going to based on resources? Can you make a living as a space prospector? Who wouldn't want to live on a colonized asteroid in the outer solar system like in the Expanse or on Mars, fighting genetic defects like in Arnold Schwarzenegger film? That question has been asked and it's hard. Right now, I must stress that, 20 years ago the answer was no or someone would have done it. Yet today, with launch costs dropping, it's getting complicated and we move towards viability. And yes, there are ways emerging. And the asteroids are probably the first to step here because they have low gravity wells that we could take advantage of for rich availability of resources like platinum that might turn a profit. And there are those thinking of doing that. But there is no really concrete plan in motion yet. Market volatility plays in there. And there are ideas, but nothing that screams it might really happen. But asteroids are not planets, so when looking at other worlds of the solar system, you actually get rather limited. So the gas giants might be useful to scoop hydrogen and helium from, but not much else. Same with Uranus and Neptune. Helium is useful for sure, because we have a finite supply, but hydrogen we have. So it seems that mining hydrogen from those planets is a far future concept. When we run out of helium on Earth, which is a real problem, 
We have the moon as it accumulated on its surface, and the sun shooting it off constantly. That helium, especially helium-3, may be of importance in nuclear fusion, and it's renewable. Helium streams from the sun, and when we run out of helium here on Earth, we will need more as we use it in industrial processes. And helium prices are rising, and shortages are starting to happen. So the moon benefits from both being close and having a viable resource we already know is there. When helium gets expensive enough, it will be worth mining there. But the other rocky planets and the moons, not so much. Venus is hopeless to mine, even though it's probably rich in metals. Mars has promise, but again, it's got a gravity well to get past in order to launch stuff off the surface. Things like gold would need to get extremely expensive to make it worth it. Oddly though, the smaller bodies of the solar system such as Mars are less differentiated and may have significantly higher availability of metals near the surface. But there is a question mark in the solar system that hasn't been well explored, and it's Mercury. Mercury, when in the sunlight, is a hot, hellish place. It's the closest planet to the sun. In darkness, it becomes an ice box. The moon also does this, but Mercury is worse. But that hasn't stopped the science fiction writers. Both Leigh Brackett and Isaac Asimov had Mercury stories. Which a fun aspect of the stories is that at the time, it was thought Mercury was tidally locked, but it's actually not. As an aside, Leigh Brackett had a very exceptional career. Here I mention short stories she wrote in the 1940s, and after success, there she moved into screenwriting. An early project was helping William Faulkner with the screenplay for The Big Sleep, but she also co-wrote the screenplay for The Empire Strikes Back years later. Arthur C. Clarke also had a tidally locked Mercury early on in a story, but he actually went into a colony on Mercury with Rendezvous with Rama. And then much more recently is Kim Stanley Robinson, who saw Mercury as a home to a huge city called Terminator that rolls around the planet on tracks to keep ahead of the sun. And there have been others. But what of the practicality of actually putting a base of some sort on Mercury? This is where it gets complicated. As I mentioned, Mercury is not tidally locked to the sun, but is in a resonance with it, so it has a slow rotation rate. This means that one side is always exposed to the sun for a long period of time, which means heat in excess of 427 degrees Celsius, or 800 Fahrenheit. In the cold dark, it's down to over negative 190 Celsius or negative 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Those are very severe extremes, so anything you build there will need to withstand that. It does, however, have polar regions that are in permanent shade, like the shielded craters on the moon that do contain water ice. Some of this ice could be holding a large amount of water for a colony, as much as a trillion tons being easily accessible. And in some of those craters, it could be as much as 20 meters thick. And here we get into a speculative but interesting idea. The idea of building domes on Mars is an old one. You just build a dome and fill it with an atmosphere, and you don't have to terraform the rest of Mars, which is a much more daunting task. But there is an interesting take on this that might be quite relevant specifically to Mercury. In 1992, Richard Taylor advanced the concept of paraterraforming, using an enclosure to hold in an atmosphere, potentially even sealing off a water ice filled crater Inside, you would have a regulated environment with its own water cycle. And water contains oxygen that can be split for breathing. And you can do that with sunlight. You could then create a livable habitat. And mercury has organics and nutrients, so growing food in such an environment should be possible. And you'd forever be in darkness anyway, so your colony would be cool even during the day. You could then further build from the crater a cave system to enlarge your colony. This actually reminds me of the Genesis device in Star Trek. You can't do it in a day, but you can build a sealed enclosure underground, on bodies like the Moon and Mercury. And there are thoughts to be natural lava tubes on Mercury, much like the Moon, that may be of use. The advantage to lava tubes in digging is shielding both from the sun and from space in an environment without a magnetic field. 
And it has to be said that Mercury is easier than the moon on the question of gravity and living on it. It's twice that of the moon. So while not even half that of Earth, it's getting closer into comfortable territory while maintaining a low gravity well for launching materials from it into space. It's also more or less closer to Earth than the asteroid belt and its resources are. One aspect of Mercury that would be a useful double-edged sword is the amount of energy it receives from the Sun. It's much closer to the Sun, with concentrated energy hitting it that could be harvested various ways or beamed back to the surface for use in the colony. It would have no shortage of available energy that in principle you could beam it to other planets for use in concentrated form using intermediate stations to transfer it along the path. Once established, then the real benefits of Mercury would become evident. Mercury has a lot of metal, so much so that it's hypothesized that it actually is the core of a planet that saw its original mantle stripped off in a cataclysmic collision. This led to a world that is 70% metal. In many ways, Mercury is the best planet in the solar system for materials availability for use in construction and you wouldn't have to go too deeply to get to them. If you find that Mercury is not for you, it actually is very forgiving on travel to and from it, because due to its short year, it's swinging around the sun fast. It hits its closest point to Earth every 116 days. This means that it has a lot of launch windows, basically every few months, which is far more opportunities than Venus and Mars has. Venus it's over a year and a half between windows, and Mars famously is 26 months. And you can get there in a much shorter time than you can Mars, though getting into orbit of Mercury is tricky. But it is possible to settle Mercury, and there are reasons to do so, at least in the future. It's a huge amount of easily accessible resources, receives a lot of energy, has craters where we could build bases and habitats, and more importantly water ice that are permanently shielded from the sun's rays. Will we ever do it? That depends on many questions, such as population or outright survival. But can we think of ways? Yes. Thanks for listening. I'm futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently imagining the future of asteroid mining of precious metals and how easy that would be to bring back the pirate world. Shiver me timbers, yo-ho, drink up me hearties, and how unpleasant that actually was back in the day. And be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.